The, uh, the next talk is a compendium of container escapes. We're in South Seas ABE with Brandon Edwards and Nick Freeman. I guess we don't have, the, yeah, we have mics on, all right. Yeah, that's good. Uh, yeah, thanks everybody for coming along uh, this afternoon, and thanks to Black Hat for having us here as well. It's pretty good. Um, I'm Nick Freeman, and today we're going to be talking about container escapes. Uh, we both work at Capsulate, where we both hack on Linux and build ways to protect against attacks on Linux systems. I, uh, I didn't know we were doing accents today, Nick. Um, so my name is Brandon Edwards. I work with Nick at uh, Capsulate, hacking on Linux stuff. Uh, so a bit about the scope for this afternoon. Uh, what we're going to do is talk about getting from a contained process outside onto the underlying Linux host. Not from a malicious image that you can deploy with crazy flags, not going from container to container, and not talking about orchestrators. The scenario is that we're in a container, maybe one that's running on an orchestrator, uh, but focuses on the attack vectors available from within that container. Uh, if you want to know about attacking Kubernetes, we hope that you went to or can time travel to uh, Ian Coldwell's talk yesterday at 1.30 p.m. in Lagoon JKL. Uh, we're also specifically discussing containers on Linux, so we won't be covering any other of the inferior operating systems. Um, <laughs> for all Linux uh, kernel-related information, we'll be referring to the 4X series. Uh, it also, it's worth noting that the container ecosystem, like we had to scope this down because the ecosystem's huge, and if you tried to cover all the different uh, enumerations of deployment, it would, it would be massive, and you, there's no way we could do it in a 50-minute talk. So that means we're, we're only covering the predominant uh, widely deployed uh, runtimes and environments. So that mostly means like Docker or Kubernetes, out of scope are things like Red Hat's Podman or Firecracker. So these are the volumes of the compendium we're presenting today. First up, before we get into any escapology, we're going to cover some container basics. Uh, so setting the stage of how we can break down the walls and get out of the container. The first volume is all about vulnerabilities that have been found and sometimes patched in container engines. Uh, we won't spend too much time here. If you want to tie this to the give the person a fish versus teach a person to fish, uh, this is giving you the fish. And the fish has been dead for a while and probably smells a bit bad. But it can help explain some of the importance of the basics we're going to go through first. After that, we're going to switch to more practical information on how to break out of a container. This is teaching you how to fish. So the second volume covers ways in which containers can be insecurely deployed or configured to increase their attack surface or otherwise weaken them. And the techniques we outline in this section will probably give you the most mileage when you're trying to break out of a container. And finally, in volume three, we're going to cover how the kernel can and has been exploited to escape containers. And we will cover how you can and shouldn't try to break out of a container using a kernel exploit here. All right, so now we're on to uh, the first volume in our compendium. Uh, this is a basic, you know, required reading, container basics. Um, so this is pretty dumb, but containers are not virtual machines. Uh, we, it was necessary to put this in because there's still a lot of uh, confusion around this. Containers are often conflated with VMs. Uh, they don't have their own kernel. They don't have their own drivers. They don't have uh, their own virtualized hardware. They're, they're just tasks. Uh, and what is a task? Well, a kernel calls processes and threads tasks. Uh, and a container is a task or a set of tasks with uh, special properties to isolate them and restrict their access to system resources. Uh, you can see on the screen here where I've poorly depicted a process tree showing imaginary scenario of tasks where we have a container engine running an Nginx container, and like all the other tasks, it descends from in it. Uh, so proc's a pretty special file system uh, that allows access and information from the kernel. Uh, kernel uses task structs to define tasks, and you can refer to many of the task attributes by querying its pid entry in the proc file system. Um, that's pretty much all we're going to say about the task track for now, but we'll definitely touch on it in the kernel section. Um, just remember that basically it holds most of the isolation mechanisms that make a container contained. And this is a mostly accurate mapping of task track entries to proc entries for reference. I'm not really going to speak to it, but you can read it later. So we've established what containers are, that they're tasks with just special properties. Uh, what are those properties? Uh, those are credentials, capabilities, where the file system root is located, namespaces, C groups, uh, Linux security modules, and sometimes seccom. Uh, it's largely the job of the container engine to apply these different properties, and we'll cover more of that in later sections. But for now, know that when we mention uh, a container engine, we mean the thing that instills the environment that facilitate containers. Uh, first, we're going to start off by covering what each of these different properties are. Uh, so the first container attribute is credentials. Um, 
and that's because all tasks have credentials, uh, but it becomes important. Uh, so credentials are used to associate a user identity to a task. Uh, these are the user and group IDs for permission checks, like when you're trying to access files. Uh, the diagram on the right is from a page in the Linux programming interface released in 2010 by NoSarch Press. Uh, it shows the relationship between various set UID syscall functions and their effects on the effective, real, and stored uh, user IDs. And it looks a little witchy, actually. So on the left, we have a picture of the Seal of Lilith, which according to a fringe GeoCities page I found on Wayback Machine is supposedly from a book called The Sun of Great Knowledge, also no starch press, circa 1225. Hmm. Uh, so we'll be referring to them more when we talk about namespaces, user namespaces later on. Uh, the one important thing to note here is that credentials are not a coarse enough mechanism to restrict container privileges. And to address the coarse nature of credentials, capabilities were introduced. In around kernel 2.2, which was released in the Middle Ages, uh, root privileges were separated into different groups known as capabilities. Times change, and being root is no longer necessarily quite root enough. You can be semi-root, quasi-root, the margarine of root, the diet coke of root. Just one capability, not root enough. Capabilities are used as a key isolation mechanism by some container engines. Uh, shown here are the capabilities that Docker assigns to new containers by default. So no, you can't uh, load a kernel module, you can't go and remount things. Not all container engines take the same approach. Uh, LXC by default grants pretty much every capability, but it relies on user namespaces instead to reduce the scope of the capabilities. Like, you can be capsis admin inside the container without wrecking the host. The container's root file system is another property which sets it apart from other tasks. Uh, the container's root is often placed in a special file system mount. Uh, modern Docker, for example, uses overlayFS, the operation of which supports uh, management of layers so that modified data does not actually affect the underlying container image. Uh, instead, any modifications made on this overlayFS are stored in a diff directory. Uh, Here's some pseudocode that you probably can't read, uh, or some pseudo terminal out output that's not very readable, uh, showing the overlay IFS diff directory. The, the TLDR here is that the container's root mount is actually a path that's reachable for at least any modified data from the host file system. And this becomes important when we start talking about container escapes because it's useful to know the host path to reach files with attacker controlled content. Uh, and it's, in this case, available through the overlay IFS upper directory. Uh, so next up are namespaces, which give processes a different view of a host resource. They're pretty important in container land and normally one of the first things people think about when you talk about containers. As an analogy, think of them like a private karaoke room. You're still inside the karaoke parlor, but you can only hear yourself or anyone of your friends in the room with you. Uh, but the employees can definitely hear you even if they don't want to. Uh, there are a bunch of namespaces, as you can see. Uh, we're only going to talk about a couple of them. Uh, the first is the PID namespace, and this is what makes PID start at one inside a container. The user namespace, which maps UIDs so that root inside the container is actually a garbage UID on the host. And the mount namespace, which defines what the root of a container's file system is, more or less. You need Capsus admin to make new namespaces of most types, except for user namespaces. So C groups or control groups impose resource lim limits on tasks. Uh, this is really mostly about hardware. So this mostly stops uh, containers from messing with hardware, peripherals, other devices. They don't really impact our escape technique, so we're not going to spend any more time on them. Uh, LSMs, Linux security modules, like AppArm or Nessie Linux, are, however, something we are going to spend time on because they're an important component in what makes a container contained. Um, they're used for much more than containers, obviously, but they're, they're pivotal here in containers and add a good extra layer of defense. So for containers, uh, Linux security modules are used to reduce access to system calls and sensitive file paths, and to prevent containers from mounting new writable proc and sysfs entries, for example, or ptracing other programs, uh, or any potentially other dangerous behaviors that a, a container may want to take. Even if the task has the required capabilities and privilege to do those things, these LSMs uh, get in the way, and they generally uh, prevent those from going through, and they generally help reduce the attack surface for the containers, even if they've been running with extra privilege. So for Docker, AppArmor represents one of the strongest defenses, but it's certainly not perfect. SecComps are another mechanism used to isolate containerized processes by restricting access to system calls. Uh, the default Docker SecComp policy is pretty comprehensive uh, and locks down a number of potential, uh, potentially not so good system calls you want the container to do. Uh, and it also makes others which you would normally be able to do, like unshare, uh, require caps as admin. So it can put some extra restrictions in place. This is kind of relevant because a number of kernel exploits require you to have uh, unshare available in order to get Capsus admin and user namespace so you can create other namespaces. Um, as an aside, 
LXE doesn't really restrict any of this in SecComp, but basically just limits loading of kernel modules and a couple of other things. As another aside, SecComp's entirely neutered by Kubernetes, which makes a lot of publicly available kernel exploits work really good. Um, when that wouldn't work on a plain old Docker installation, could work uh, pretty well on a container running under Kubernetes. Oh, a handful of weeks ago, this PR was opened. So it's for a markdown document, but it's a good sign that Kubernetes is actually thinking of taking SecComp a little bit more seriously. So this hideous image somewhat conveys how we think about the container security model. Uh, the blue being what you think you can do. Uh, for example, I've got unlimited, an unlimited train pass that says I can travel anywhere. Uh, orange being what you can actually do. So that train pass is actually only valid for students, or you can only use it during weekends. And red being where you can do it. So maybe it's only valid on certain train lines in the city. Uh, I can't travel throughout the world on it, even if I am a student and it is the weekend. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. It's not my best work. Um, after that heavily abbreviated introduction to containers, this section is going to briefly hop through some vulnerabilities in container engines and, and their impact. Like we said, it's going to be pretty light because these things are, for the most part, patched and uh, won't help you too much in the real world. First up is Docker. Uh, most Docker vulns today can be lumped into a handful of categories, uh, weak proc permissions, uh, host file descriptors, and uh, ho host file descriptor leakage, and symlinks. And the FD leakage and symlinks often kind of go hand in hand, but not necessarily one-to-one -one mapping. Uh, the first one we're just going to touch on briefly, uh, 2015, 36, 31. Uh, this led a malicious, uh, a malicious image uh, deployed to uh, overwrite its uh, LSM attributes. So you could null out AppArm or AC Linux, make it uncombined, and remove all of the uh, restrictions that the engine was kind of relying on being there. Uh, the second is actually just from this year, um, 15664, which was a race condition in follow symlink and scope, which was meant to make sure that the symlink was followed within the container and not in the host, and it didn't really do that. Um, so if you won the race condition and with a few other prerequisites, you could write to an arbitrary location on the, on the host, which is not great. We will spend a minute or two on the interesting run C vuln from earlier this year, because it touches on some of the complexities of running things in a container. So a, a couple of things use run C. For some background, regular container execs look something like this. Run C or fork and apply isolation controls like namespaces as it goes, and ends up still being a copy of run C sitting inside the, uh, inside the container. In this case, let's say, yeah, the entry point's like java dash jar something dot jar, a java process. Uh, the in container run C is going to execute that entry point, that java process, and that's what PS would kind of look like. But if that entry point was actually a link to procself exe, uh, we have a problem, because procself exe is going to reference the run C binary back on the host. And this means our unprivileged tenant inside the container now has access to a sensitive host resource. Now, our malicious process can get a hold of the file descriptor pointing to the host run C. This is mostly, most easily done with a malicious library that will uh, be loaded by run C when it runs inside the container, and it can hijack that file descriptor. And it won't be able to write to it at this point because run C is still running, it's going to get etext busy, but uh, we'll be able to write to it later. Uh, if we uh, wait until that run C exec dies and opens it with write permissions and clobber it, uh, we can put our own bad run C in place. This is easy enough done by passing the FDA across to the new exec process, which keeps on trying to open it for write until run C stops doing its thing, and then our evil process can clobber away. Uh, so we're going to show a quick demo of this, which is mostly based on the uh, original POC by the bug finders who were nominated for a pony. Yep, I believe. Um, the small changes we made were uh, making it do, uh, send a reverse shell into the container and maintaining the functionality of run C uh, instead of kind of breaking it. Okay. Let's see if this will work. So we'll start off by running a Python container. And you can see it's just us inside the container. There's nothing else in there. I'm going to copy over our payload from the host. Uh, just showing, like doing a witch of run C, you can see it's still a binary at this point, which is a good thing. 
um, extracting the payload inside the container, and we'll run make.sh, which downloads a few tools that we need uh, and kind of sets us up to uh, put our malicious libc comp in place and this us when we exec, it'll overwrite it. So if we file run C again now, uh, we've got a bash script there, which is probably not ideal. Um, we can still do run C things um, and it's gone back to being a binary, which is good. But over in our container, we've got a reverse shell and we can see our file path is the containers directory on the host. And we can docker ps, see all the processes out of the container. Good. We're also gonna chat about Rocket for a second. So this set of Rocket vulnerability is kind of similar to the run C escape and that involves the same kind of mechanism like executing into a container. Um, so this, yeah, this diagram should look kind of familiar. Um, the difference in the nature of these CVEs is that Rocket doesn't actually drop anything. Um, there's no state comp, all the capabilities are still in place, and C groups aren't applied. And because Rocket enter requires you to run as a root, uh, not dropping anything is super bad. Uh, the good thing, I guess, or something, is that it's not getting patched. Uh, Rocket's basically abandoned where at this point, with Red Hat favoring Podman, so happy hunting if you do actually find someone who runs Rocket. Uh, so that summarizes a section on bugs or weaknesses in container engines themselves. Uh, we're gonna move on to volume two of our compendium, Escape via Weakness and Deployment, where we'll be summarizing each of these as bad ideas. So the first bad idea is the Docker socket. Uh, the Docker socket or container D socket is a Unix socket used to manage the container engine. Uh, whenever you run a Docker command, you're really actually running a Docker client that's talking over uh, this socket to the Docker uh, daemon. Uh, just speaks HTTP, it's really simple, but you really should not expose this because any jerk can just curl against it or run a Docker to point at it in order to schedule uh, privileged containers on with host mounts and fully take over the system. Um, you would ask why would anyone want to expose the Docker socket into the container, but people do this so that they can run Docker inside of Docker and go another level deeper with Inception. But because you're still talking to the Docker that's outside of your container when you schedule something, uh, you, you, you pop out of, of the container you schedule a new instance. Speaking of privileged containers and bad ideas, that's actually bad idea number two. Um, if you run a Docker container with the dash dash privilege flag, you're basically throwing away all of the uh, isolation features from a security standpoint. So no Linux security modules like AppArmor. Uh, you'll have full capabilities. Um, so none of the, the capability drop stuff and it's, you know, all the danger. So uh, one example out of the gate is like install a module, a kernel module from your privilege container and it's, it's obviously game over. Privilege containers can also register user mode helper programs. Uh, a couple weeks ago now, Felix Wilhelm managed to fit an escape using a C group user mode helper program into a single tweet. Uh, this is one of a variety of many different user mode helpers which can be used to escape from privilege container and the exploitation pattern of that's gonna be something we'll, we'll be covering. So actually, we're gonna segue here to talk about user mode helper programs. Airhorn, airhorn, airhorn. Um, user mode helper programs are programs which are invoked by the kernel as an event-driven callback. These programs are often uh, invoked in a privileged context in the host namespace and will execute with full capabilities. Uh, consequently, the ability to register a user mode helper program from within a container facilitates an escape as it allows the controlled program from within the container to be executed by a privileged K thread outside of the container. In this segue, we're gonna go through this generic pattern to show what the, the steps are that are repeatable and then we'll give you a couple of specific examples. So imagine that we started out by popping a container that was deployed with dash dash privilege flag and we want to escape. The first step is to figure out uh, the, the overlay FS path. This was the path which, if you recall from uh, before in the root file system uh, part, is a path on the host that can reach files that have been modified or created within the container. By default with Docker, you can determine this from within a container by reading the upper dir entry of etcm tab. The overlay FS path should look similar here uh, to what we had before. The next thing you would do is prepend your payload with this path so that we have a path that reaches our payload from the host file system. Perfect. So user mode helper programs all involve the use of some sort of special file system, be it procfs or cgroupfs. Um, so sometimes you'll have uh, the ability to write to that file system or sometimes you'll have to mount it uh, to get access to the user mode helper callback file that you'll need to write to. Um, so this ne next step here is, is demonstrating that you know, we've, we're mounting up the, the special fs as part of the pattern. 
Um, with the endpoint mounted, we then would echo a payload into whatever the callback file is for that user mode helper. So in the C group tweet with, uh, by Felix, uh, that was the release agent, uh, C group release agent callback file. But the pattern generally remains the same across different ones as well. Now that we've echoed our payload into that callback file that specifies what should be called when the event takes place, the kernel knows who to call when it needs help, which will be our payload residing within the container. And with the kernel aware of what to do when the event takes place, we can either trigger the trigger or wait for the related event to, to occur. When it does, uh, Kthread will execute whatever helper program was mapped to that event, and thus the container is escaped, and the in container payload is now running as root on the host. While we use the example of running with dash dash privilege, it might seem a little lame, and sure, like that was a bad idea to deploy stuff. It's important to remember that this is a, a pattern that can be used in lots of scenarios where you have some sort of crack in the, in the container security model. Uh, and so we'll be, you know, anything from sensitive mounts to even use, use in kernel exploitation itself. So we'll be, we'll be circling back to this a couple times. So at this point, we've got a demo. Um, I have to stand over here so I can actually see the screen and talk about what's going on. Um, I click it here. Oh man. So we're running a privileged container. As you can see, it's highlighted here. Um, the first thing we're going to do is get the IP for a connect back shell from the host out. Throughout this, all of our demos involve uh, getting connect back shells from the host. So we're going to write a boilerplate uh, bash dev TCP connect back shell with the same IP that we've discovered. Make that executable. We now are going to begin writing uh, the actual escape to register the release, uh, the, the user mode helper, which is here in this case is the C group release agent. So the first thing we do is get this overlay, uh, the overlay path. I did not come up with this pretty regex. Uh, that's Felix's work. That's taken from his tweet, and we use it all throughout a lot of our demos. It's one of the most useful things, I think, is uh, how to get to that path that can reach into the container. Um, so we prepend that path to our payload of shell, and we echo that into the release agent, that's the callback file. I then try to escape them. And we then simply run the escape. It waits a couple seconds, netcat starts listening, it connects back in. So usually when you can see no job control in this shell as a hacker, your job, your job is completed actually. Uh, but as you can see, we're, we're, we're PS on the host in the out of the container namespace. We can even run Docker commands or type lol on the terminal's root. So these are some of the user mode helpers that are confirmed for being useful in, in uh, uh, container escapes. It's not just C groups. So you have uh, uh, it, you have everything from the release agent, which we just saw. But another example is bin format misc, which is what determines the handler for like shebangs when you run like a Python script or a shell script. Um, that one you exploit a little bit differently, but can be used. Another is core pattern, which we'll be we'll be showing here in a little bit. Uh, this is a helper when a pro called when a program crashes to generate a core dump. So this is the program that actually goes, collects the info, and dumps in maybe reports stuff back to your uh, distro. Um, we'll be we'll be demoing a few of these as well for escaping out of the container based on different conditions. Uh, so while Docker drops a bunch of capabilities by default, sometimes people or systems add them back in. Uh, we have a couple on this slide that have some security implications. Uh, but we will largely speak to Capsys admin, which is largely considered true root. Uh, the, the can kind of vary depending on the container runtime and uh, any LSMs interfering. Uh, for example, uh, AppArmor would restrict mount, but it wouldn't necessarily restrict BPF. Uh, and on some operating systems like CentOS, sysadmin is less restricted. If you have sysadmin, you can remount proc, read, write, and things like this, which can enable a bunch of the user mode helpers that Brandon was just talking about. Uh, also, running as root is largely excessive inside the container, and not doing that helps. The fourth and final bad idea we're going to discuss uh, are, are sensitive mounts. Um, here we're going to go into proc, but it extends beyond that. And actually, a couple weeks ago, there was, a, or last week maybe, I don't know, time's all blurring into one, um, there was a, a post about how a log mount could be used to uh, escape from Kubernetes. In general, having host resources volume mounted into your container uh, can present a, a security risk and should be avoided or done very carefully. Uh, for this example, though, we will be using proc. So, by the way, here, here's an app armor, uh, the app armor policy for proc. This is what protects a lot of the things that we're about to do from normally happening. Uh, the thing is that app armor is path based. So, the volume mount that we've gotten in that, uh, that is to slash host slash proc doesn't fit the pattern that's being matched here, and thus the restrictions no longer apply. Uh, so you, you can easily shoot yourself in the foot thinking like, oh, it'll protect from proc, and it's like, no, it protects from the slash proc 
Um, so we can read and write to any to anything in this new proc because it's not being protected. The ability to write to this proc mount exposes user mode helper programs such as the core pot pattern helper that we just introduced. And as you notice from the slide, we've got horses in the back, proc mount is attached, user mode callback that we're escaping at black hair, right? <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, we'll actually demo that uh, a little bit, um, the core pattern one, in the next section uh, when we circle back to it to show that it can also be used under even more scenarios. We don't want to have a repeated demo all over the place. This is just a summary of bad ideas. We're sure you have plenty of your own. Um, there are other ways to shoot yourself in the foot as well. This is just some of the ways that people seem to do it most regularly. So now on to volume three, which is escaping via kernel exploitation. Uh, it should be pretty obvious, but the security model of containers is predicated on kernel integrity. Uh, one theme that we're going to discuss, discuss in this section is how any kernel vulnerability which can be exploited to get arbitrary code execution in the kernel can also uh, enable escapery. But we're actually going to start off with uh, a vulnerability, like an example of vulnerability that doesn't grant you this in the kernel, uh, but does still allow you to escape. Uh, to demonstrate this, we'll be walking through how exploiting dirty cow, the implications of which are mostly in user land, can be used to break out of a container. Uh, dirty cow is a vulnerability affecting the kernel's copy on write mechanism. Uh, there's a lot of nuance and detail behind the mechanics of the copy on write mechanism and of how Dirty Cow is itself exploited. Each topic would actually warrant its own presentation here, uh, if not even a longer slot somewhere. So for the sake of brevity, we're going to grossly summarize the mechanism and its exploitation so that we can jump into how you can use it for escape artistry. So the exploitation of Dirty Cow allowed for an unprivileged task to write to a read-only memory mapping, including a shared file mem memory mappings, uh, which resulted in modified data being written back to the mapped file. This could be used to overwrite library code on disk, which will then later be executed by uh, privileged programs, en enabling a local privilege escalation. Which, okay, cool, but that sounds like you have to be somewhere in an environment where something with more privileges is operating on files that you share, and if containers have isolated file systems, who cares if a container task can corrupt shared objects in the container? <clears throat> Introducing the virtual dynamic shared objects, which is a special mapping shared from the kernel with user land to provide quick access to frequently used functions without the pain the overhead of a syscall. For example, calling time. So on the left, we have a container that's running in its own namespace and isolated. And on the right, we have hosting a task face, which is a privileged and uh, privileged task running in the host. Despite having separate virtual address spaces and the container having namespaces, at the night when they look up at the sky, they see the same VDSO. So this means that the leak container process can exploit Dirty Cow to modify the VDSO mapping and add some totally sweet new bonus features to it. Uh, and everyone else who has the mapping of VDSO, which is every other task, including hosting McTask face, will include these sweet new bonus features. So when hosting McTask face asks what time it is, it's party time. Let's talk about, uh, I want to move here, so that was uh, like a one-off of like, oh, you can't get code execution from this in the kernel, but you can in user land, so that can help you get out of the container. Uh, I think we should talk, now we're going to start talking about the means by which you can get out of a container when you can get arbitrary code execution in the kernel. Uh, we'll start by covering some common goals and patterns of kernel exploitation. Um, by doing this, we're, we're really going to go over the, we're going to genericize the, the kernel exploitation patterns and how those can apply to, uh, to, to get an escape without even talking about container-specific structures, and then we'll get into con container-specific structures. So let's say you're in user space and you've got a memory corruption bug or a use after free in the kernel. What are the standard exploitation patterns? First step is usually performing the laborious work of setting up the bug. This is the tedium and ignobility of grooming the memory layout or walking some object into a specific vulnerable state. Once your bug is set up, you're ready to trigger it and inflict influence on whatever data structures that are now under your control, perhaps corrupting a function pointer or a return address. From that point of having control of execution flow, the next step in the pattern is to ROP like it's hot and usually land on a function like native write CR4 to disable SMEP and SMAP. Once you have SMEP and SMAP disabled, you then return to your user land code. This is one of the cooler parts about kernel exploitation. Uh, code now running as ring zero uh, as returned back because it can execute in user space. And so your payload that's running as ring zero is actually something you can write in C. Um, and this is one, yeah, this is one of the more fun parts. Once you have your payload executing in user land, the final step in the textbook pattern uh, for this exploitation is to call back in to prepare and commit new privilege credentials to the currently running task, which gives your task's root privileges. Now you can spawn your root shell and do your stuff. This is a very commonly repeated pattern across a lot of exploits all the way back to like spender stuff. 
Um, so here's the task struct, and we can see that there's the task struct member cred as a pointer credentials for this task. Uh, the cred struct, which is, as we've just demonstrated, one of the key targets of Linux exploitation uh, for privilege escalation, actually contains references to a vast majority of the security mechanisms used by containers. So control of the cred struct allows setting things like credentials to make the task root, as well as possessing full capabilities, but it goes beyond that. You'll see that the void star security pointer there is kind of ambiguous, but that's where app armor lives. And so when you have the new credentials, you also have no, new, no app armor uh, constraints being applied to the task. It's worth noting that uh, we can see that user namespace is also affected by this, but it's not really because it's a different pointer than the one that's in the NS proxy of the task struct. So it kind of puts the task into this weird state where for some operations, like file operations, uh, you are true root because of the user namespace control that comes out of the credential struct, but for doing other things like mount, uh, that comes out of the NS proxy struct, and so it's like, depending on what you're doing, you may or may not have uh, new privileges. Um, Cool. I think after, so after committing the new cred struct, the, you know, with the vanilla sort of textbook kernel exploitation pattern, uh, this is more or less what a, a task security model really looks like. Uh, most of the doors have been opened. Uh, SecComp is still there, but most of its meaningful uh, directives are based on your capability set, so it's less of a barrier. Sorry. <laughs> so before we get into fancier kernel struct manipulation, let's just start from this textbook kernel pattern. Um, and, and walk about, like, once you've called uh, commit creds and, and gotten your new credential struct, uh, assuming that there's no user namespace set, which again, Docker and Kubernetes do not set by default, uh, you, can get, you can start to do a lot of the same tricks as if you had been past the privilege flag. Um, this means that the same user mode helper payloads start to apply. So now, finally, we'll visualize the, uh, the core pattern one that we had mentioned before. Oh, clicky click. So we're in a container, and I don't know how to use a mouse. And so the first thing we're gonna do is show that we don't have capabilities. I actually learned that I could have just run cap sh dash dash print, but you guys get to suffer through me copying and pasting for an extra 20 seconds. Uh, but you can see our capabilities are pretty limited here. There's just that reduced set that we have. In here, we have a privilege escalation exploit and a program to crash. The privilege escalation exploit is not one that we wrote. It's actually from Andrei Knovelov at Google. Uh, we just took it off the shelf and as, as an example of like, take a textbook kernel exploit, turn it into a container escape. Um, so crash is a really dumb program. We're just gonna show you there's nothing up our sleeve. We're gonna disassemble it. You're gonna see it's got two instructions. Uh, we XOR out RAX and then we try to write something to that as a pointer, as an address. It's, it's a dumb bug. We're on crash, okay, it's a seg fault. Okay, so we've got our crashing program, and this is important because for core pattern, we're going to need to have a crash to trigger that event. So let's set up our callback for our, our shell again. So uh, get our IP address, gonna get shell, our little shell script back in here for, again, our dev TCP standard connect back. And we're gonna paste in the stuff, and I'll pause here to talk through it. Okay, so we are, uh, we're in a container, we've escalated privileges, there's an existing proc thing present, so we're gonna mount a new proc mount that has read-write. Um, there, there are other ways you can, you can work around this that we may be able to get into if there's time permitting at the end, but uh, in short, you can see that this also follows a lot of the same pattern of, of the other exploits that we, we were talking about. So we need to get the overlay FS, which we do, thanks again, Felix. We prepend that to our payload, we echo that into core pattern, what determines what happens when a crash happens. We're gonna make it executable, and then we're, gonna, we're going to run the escape in the background because it's going to connect back to us. Ah, so first we run our privilege escalation, right. This is, we've now updated our cred struct. And this is probably unnecessary, but to show you, look, our caps have changed, we've got better capabilities. Um, so we run the escape in the background, and we actually have to get out of the, the root shell that it gave us because it ended up disabling a bunch of networking, so we had to go back to our faux root shell. And then, as you can see, a second later, we get our connect back from the crash being called by the escape, uh, and now we are on the host. Yep. Uh, so things can be a little bit different if the container is actually using user namespaces. Uh, they help for a lot of different things, but not so much when you're inside the kernel. You can just apply a few extra steps. Ultimately, we just want to apply some properties of an out of container task to our in container task, and there are a whole bunch of routes we can take for this, so we're just gonna touch on a couple. 
Uh, this approach is largely taken from a public container escape exploit published in March by CyberArk, and we're going to spend a minute or two going over their steps. In short, they focused on stealing some privileged namespaces, the mount and the PID namespaces. Uh, copying these from an out-of-container process gave us the processes view, uh, that, that processes view of the whole system from root down, proc, and sys, all the good things. So to escape by stealing namespaces, uh, we first need a set of namespaces to steal, uh, an NS proxy that's outside of the container. What this exploit did was copy init in in proxy's mount namespace to the in container init or in container hid one, uh, which gives our in container init superpowers. Uh, note that init NS proxy is not exactly the same as the NS proxy of the init process. Uh, it's a global that can contain all of the initial that does contain all of the initial namespaces for the system. And we use the switch task namespaces function here as it holds our hand and does the heap lifting for us. Um, so after the step, our PID1 now has the ultimate pony namespace instead of the kind of lame horse mount namespace down there. And at this point in our process, the, uh, our exploit process still has the containers file system view. So uh, if you're inspecting proc, proc1 is not true in it, it is like cheapo lame in it. Um, so we can get the file descriptor, file descriptor of that in the process and open proc1 ns mount and uh, apply uh, setiness on that. Uh, so setiness uh, is going to apply the namespace referred to in that file descriptor to the calling process. And it can be filtered by the second argument. Zero means everything. Um, once our uh, exploit completes and spawns a shell, that shell is going to have the same file system view as the outer container process. So we can see things on proc, uh, run other containers, that kind of thing. This is a cut down version of the public exploit uh, we mentioned, uh, and it works for the most part, but there are a few things that are not like 100% right with this approach. Uh, the first thing is that the published exploit also sets the PID namespace on the child in the same manner as it does the mount namespace. Uh, and we didn't include it in the walkthrough here because even if you do do this uh, settings, it doesn't actually work. You can't enter, uh, uh, you can enter into child PID namespaces, but you can't go into a lower PID namespace. You can't go into the host PID namespace. Um, honestly, it's better not to bother with like messing with PID namespaces. The mapping and tracking of PIDs and lists and hash maps and uh, parent, child, and scheduling structures, non-trivial and prone to making weird things happen in the, in the kernel. Um, and you really don't need to worry about the PID namespace. Uh, the other thing that's a little bit off about this approach is that the containers in the process, uh, setting that to have the same namespace as real in it is not the best idea because that process is PID, it still thinks it's PID1. And guess what happens if you try and spawn a new process when you think you're PID1, but you're not PID1? Uh, you get killed. Um, the whole container gets killed. And often the whole system locks up as well, which is suboptimal. So we can take more of a Kool-Aid guy approach and steal a different resource from a more privileged process. And this is what we did now, container escape exploit, which we released like a handful of days, I think, after the first one. And for this, we're going to talk about the FS struct. Uh, which holds uh, information about the task current file system position with uh, path structs, one for the root file system and one for uh, CWD. And the path struct itself contains a VFS mount, and this contains references to the mount namespaces appropriate to it. Um, so copying the FS struct of a non-containerized process over to your exploit process is a quick win, and you'll get full file system access. To borrow this uh, FS struct of an uncontained process, we first need to find an uncontained process to reference. Uh, there are a few ways to do so. We're going to use a little loop that checks the PID value that you see in task structs up here. Uh, this PID is the real PID that the host namespace sees, not the inner namespace. Uh, PID is seen inside child namespaces or inside a set of different structures, uh, which we don't really need to worry about for this exercise. Uh, but if you go the namespace copying route, you definitely need to worry about them. Uh, and this is a quick loop that uh, is basically just going to traverse up to the real parent entry in the task structure to check if the given task PID is one, and that is not like cheap or container PID one. So keep on looping, and when it's there, we can swap it out and we can copy uh, real in its FS struct over to our process. Let's do a quick demo of this. Uh, so we're going to start by running a container. This one does have secop unconfined, just like Kubernetes. Uh, 
Um, and just run a few commands to install a couple of tools and add an unprivileged user and switch to that user. So just showing our current capabilities, we have just a standard Docker set, nothing too exciting. Um, nothing on home directory, we are in a container. Uh, so we're just gonna copy over our container escape exploit that's just using just FS and starting Vim in a different screen window, and we'll run our escape exploit. Uh, so now, if we get capabilities again, uh, we have all of them, which is great. Uh, we can check, see all the processes that are running on the system, and we can also see uh, that Vim instance we opened up just before. But we can't kill it because we're not in the same PID namespace. Uh, we can see it because our proxy is it, but we can't actually reference it. But we can now start a privileged container and map in the hosts, uh, use the host PID namespace and map in the host's root file system. And once we've done that, we can just root into the mapped in one and we can kill the Vim process with fire. So messing around with PID namespaces really isn't necessary. It's more trouble than it's worth. All right, so we're at time, we're getting close to it. Um, we may have a little bit of extra time here, so if so, we may show an uh, extra video, because I think we're at 10 minutes, but let's, let's wrap up with our takeaways. Um, the differences in container engines, deployment tools, Linux distributions greatly affect how secure containers are. So like running Docker on your own to run that exploit, you'd have to remove setcomp, but running Kubernetes, you don't have to remove setcomp because it just doesn't apply setcomp. Uh, the same container engine will operate different on different uh, Linux distros. Some container engines really don't care, like Rocket. Uh, abstractions provided by the orchestration can make things worse. Again, Kubernetes and abstraction upon abstraction layers is a whole nother tire fire, uh, high open shift. Um, User namespaces are one of the best isolation mechanisms when they don't enable privilege escalations themselves. So like, while it's an effective mechanism to use, the CVE that we have up here from 2018 was a kernel bug in UID mapping that actually let you break out. So it's a little ironic when the goal is to like isolate the user and it lets you break out of the namespace. Uh, engine bugs are awesome, um, but probably not how you're gonna get popped. We'll definitely see more container engine bugs, but they're all pretty transient in nature. They're gonna get patched, unless you use Rocket, I suppose. Um, much more useful for attackers are the techniques exploiting poorly configured containers, ones with extra privileges, because there are infinite flaws in layer eight and with who's deploying containers all over the show. So that's probably how you're gonna end up getting out. There are also, of course, uh, uh, streaming supply of bugs in the kernel. Uh, the namespace one is one we just mentioned, but really from any decent kernel bug, you can pound and include containerscape.h and turn it into a portal gun. Um, Good thing there aren't that many kernel bugs, except, so this is, this is a screenshot of SysBot that's just running out there on the internet publishing kernel bugs every day as it finds them, and like, uh, part of why I, I really wanted to submit this talk was, you know, when the Run C bug came out, everyone lost their minds, but then when a kernel bugs are being cranked out every day, nobody bats an eyelid. So, uh, anyway, I, I, like, uh, one stat we saw was in 2018, the kernel gained a delta on average of about 900 lines of code a day, so this well will not dry up very soon. Yeah, uh, thanks everyone for coming along. I uh, hope you learned something. Uh, please check our blog in the coming weeks for some blog posts that'll go into a bit more detail in some of these sections. Um, and yeah, it'll accompany this talk. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>